Hi everyone, welcome to the second week of Introduction to Causal Inference. In this week, we'll be talking about potential outcomes. And remember that the course website is at causalcourse.com. Don't forget to leave any questions that come up in your head during the lecture in the YouTube comments below, and I'll make sure to get to them as soon as possible. With that, let's get into the material. Here's the outline. We'll start with what are potential outcomes. Then we'll cover the fundamental problem of causal inference, and we'll talk about how to get around that fundamental problem. And we'll finish with a complete example where we actually estimate specific numbers for causal effects. This is a lot of material, so we'll, this will be broken up into a bunch of different small videos. But it's all one lecture in 41 slides. It's just broken up into smaller segments. With that, let's get into what are potential outcomes. This will be a review of the material we saw in the preview lecture. So if you saw that lecture, this first section will be review, but then later sections will be new material. So causal inference is about inferring the effect of some treatment or policy on some outcome. So consider the case that you have a headache. If you were to take a pill, it turns out that your headache would go away. And consider that if you were to not take the pill, you would still have your headache. If this were the case, then you would say that the pill has a probably has a causal effect on your headache. It makes it go away. But what if when you don't take the pill, your headache still goes away? Then would you say that the pill has a causal effect on your headache? Probably not. Then uh, it doesn't seem like the pill caused your headache to go away. So that was the basic intuition for potential outcomes. And now we'll get a bit more specific with some notation. We'll use T to denote the observed treatment and Y to denote the observed outcome. That's what we have on the right in this green box here. And we'll add more notation to this box as we get it. And Y, I, so the outcome for unit I, or, or me in this case, evaluated when I take the treatment is what I have up here on the top right. And then why I value when I don't take the treatment, T equals zero is on the bottom right. So I here is denoting the, it's a subscript to denote a specific individual or unit. This notation is a bit cumbersome, so we'll use a much simpler notation. So on the top right here, we have why I one to denote the potential outcome I would observe if I were to take treatment, if T equals one. So that's what the one in here is. It, it just means if I were to do T equals one. Similarly, Y I zero is the potential outcome I would observe if I were to not take the treatment, if I were to not take the pill. So this zero similarly is just for do T equals zero. Then we can define the causal effect as the potential outcome under treatment minus the potential outcome under no treatment. Why I zero equals zero in this case? So that means, so equals zero means that I still have the headache. I observe a headache. And that's the potential outcome I would have if I were to not take the pill. And similarly, if I were to take the pill, why I one is one means that I would not have a headache. So one means observing one for my outcome means no more headache. Observing zero for my outcome means headache. And then my causal effect would be one. So it's just one minus zero is one. With potential outcomes and causal effect defined, we can now move on to the fundamental problem of causal inference. Even though we know that the causal effect is one in this case, because we know the potential outcome under treatment is one and the potential outcome under no treatment is zero, we can't actually observe this causal effect. To see why, consider what would happen if I were to not take the pill. I would observe why I zero equals zero. So I observe, so I would observe that my headache would not go away, but I wouldn't be able to observe my potential outcome under treatment. I wouldn't be able to observe why I won. And that's because I can't go back in time and 
set conditions to exactly what they were when I didn't take the pill, and then take the pill. Similarly, if I did take the pill, so I did do t equals zero, I would observe my potential outcome under treatment, yi1 equals one. But then I wouldn't be able to observe my potential outcome under no treatment for the same reason as before. So in both these cases, I can't observe one of the potential outcomes. The other potential outcome, the, the one that I can't observe, is a counterfactual. And the one that I do observe is a, a factual, say. And because I can't observe one of these, I can't actually observe the unit-level causal effect on the bottom right there. This is often referred to as the fundamental problem of causal inference. This fundamental problem can also be interpreted with as a missing data problem. So in this table, we have I is the specific individual, the unit, T is the treatment that they receive, and Y is the outcome that they observe. The potential outcomes Y1 and Y0 here don't have an I subscript, but they're still for the ith individual. I just don't actually put the subscript there because they're associated with this ith column. And uh, whenever their potential outcome is associated with a specific I, the I is implicit. And if there is no I there and there's no implicit I, then it's just a random variable, which is random because it's like you're drawing a specific unit from the population. Let's go through some of these rows now. The first row, i equals 1, treatment equals 0, and the observe an outcome of 0. So because treatment equals 0, they observed their y0 potential outcome, but they didn't observe their y1 potential outcome because treatment is 0, not 1. And because of that, they can't observe their unit level causal effect. Similarly, in the second row, t equals 1, y equals 1, and because t equals 1, they observe their y1 potential outcome, and not their y0 potential outcome. So that means that their causal effect is still unobserved, right? This is the fundamental problem of causal inference, and the missing data here are a bunch of question marks. Throughout this course, I will ask you questions about material that we just saw, and this is because recalling material, in your own words, helps with memory. So the first question is, what is the fundamental problem of causal inference? So go ahead and think about that, try to answer it in your own words. With that, we'll move on to the next section. We just saw the fundamental problem of causal inference, but we need to be able to measure causal effects somehow. So this section will be about getting around the fundamental problem of causal inference to measure some causal effects. From the fundamental problem of causal inference, we know that the quantity at the top here, yi1 minus yi0, is not something that we can observe. How, do, how can we get around that? Maybe we can take an expectation, where the expectation here is over i, so over all the individuals in the population, and we'll often just not write the i. It'll be implicit in this expectation. Then we can use linearity of expectation to get this. And maybe then we can write that this is equal to the conditional expectation of y given treatment equals 1, minus the conditional expectation of y given treatment equals zero. So how would we compute the difference in these conditional expectations? If we look at the table, it would be like erasing these question marks. And then for the conditional expectation of y given t equals one, we would look at all of those potential outcomes y1 and just take the average of them to get two-thirds. Similarly, for the potential outcomes y0, we would take the average of those to get the 
conditional expectation of y given t equals zero. And then to get the difference between these expectations, we just take the difference and we get one third. That is how we would compute this average treatment effect, or average causal effect, if this equality at the top here were true. However, unfortunately, in general, it's not true. And we'll call this difference in conditional expectations the associational difference. This is meant to be distinct from the average treatment effect, or the average causal effect which are causal quantities. This difference is associational. The reason we make this big distinction between causal quantities and associational quantities is because association is not causation. So an example of that is that, say you notice that people who sleep with shoes on often wake up with headaches. So sleeping with shoes on is strongly associated with waking up with a headache, or strongly correlated with waking up with a headache. Then you might think that there's this bottom causal picture. Maybe I shouldn't sleep with shoes on because it'll make me wake up with a headache. But what if then I told you that, turns out, a lot of the people who go to sleep with shoes on also drink a lot the night before. And similarly, those same people were the ones who were waking up with headaches. So, Drinking the night before was a common cause of going to sleep with shoes on and waking up with a headache. And this is why you're seeing going to sleep with shoes on being associated with a headache. It's not because sleeping with shoes on is causing the headaches. This is commonly known as confounding. So drinking the night before confounds the effect of shoe sleeping on waking up with a headache. The graphical interpretation of this is that there's this confounding arc that goes from t to x to y, where t is the treatment, x is some covariates, and y is the outcome here. And another interpretation for why association is not causation in this case is that the shoe sleepers differ from the non-shoe sleepers in a key way. That's what we'll explain in this slide. So at the top here, we have the average treatment effect is not equal to the associational difference. And this is because the groups are not comparable. The shoe sleepers are not comparable to the non-shoe sleepers. So on the bottom here, we have the t equals one group and the t equals zero group. The t equals one group consists almost exclusively of drunk people. So the people who are sleeping with their shoes on are almost exclusively drunk people. And in the t equals zero group, we see that most of them are sober people. There's three drunk people that managed to get their shoes off before they went to bed. And there's something really important to notice here. Why is this sober guy going to sleep with his shoes on? And there are people like this. So on the subreddit Unpopular Opinion, there is this post that says sleeping with shoes on is comfortable. So that's this, uh, that's this sober guy. So one explanation for why association is not causation, right, that's this inequality at the top here, is that the treatment groups might not be comparable. And an important question is, what would comparable groups look like? If you look at the treatment groups here, they're clearly quite different. Here's what comparable groups would look like. There are the same number of drunk people and sober people in the shoe sleeping group, t equals 1, as there are in the sleeping without shoes group, t equals 0. If this is the case, then you very well might have equality here the average treatment effect very well might be equal to the associational difference when you have comparable groups. The reason I say might here is because we see that the groups are comparable along one covariate, which is whether or not they went to sleep drunk. But there could be other covariates that are important to be comparable across. And if the groups are comparable across all of those, 
then you definitely have equality. Then the average treatment effect is definitely equal to the associational difference. And the reason that in general they're not equal is because the groups might be not comparable. With that, we come to our second question. And if you weren't around for the first question because you skipped it for whatever reason, the reason we're looking at these questions is because they help you remember the material better, even if they're simple questions that were just answered in the material. So you recalling the answers to these questions is very helpful for memory. So this question is, why is association not causation? Now that we've seen that the average treatment effect is in general not equal to the associational difference, a natural question is, what assumptions can we make that would make the average treatment effect equal to the associational difference? The main assumption to get that the ATE is equal to the associational difference is ignorability, which is that the potential outcome Y1 and the potential outcome Y0 are both independent of the treatment. We will show why this makes the ATE equal to the associational difference mathematically here, but we might not get a fully satisfying explanation until we see causal graphical models next week. So, if we look at the ATE here, on the left-hand side, if we assume ignorability, then we can condition on treatment, because both potential outcomes are independent of treatment, so we have this equality. Then, we just have that this turns into the associational difference. So the potential outcome Y1, given that my treatment was 1, is the same as the outcome given that my treatment was 1. Similarly, potential outcome Y0 given treatment equals 0 is the same as my outcome given that treatment equals 0. One way to see why this assumption is called ignorability is to look at that missing data example that we had before, and these question marks, if we were to just ignore them and then compute the means here and take the difference then we get the ATE under the assumption of ignorability. So if ignorability is true, then we can just ignore the question marks. Another way we could see how this is called ignorability is to look at this causal graph here where there is confounding. So in this graph, we don't have ignorability. But if we were to look at this treatment assignment mechanism or treatment selection mechanism, so that's the arrow from the covariates to treatment. It's how the treatment is assigned. If that assignment mechanism were ignorable, you know, if there's no arrow there, then we would have ignorability. And that's because confounding disappears when we delete that edge. We'll see this more when we get to graphical causal models. Another perspective on this same assumption is exchangeability. So exchangeability and ignorability are the same thing but they can give you kind of different perspectives for why the assumption makes it so that the average treatment effect is equal to the associational difference. To see what the exchangeability perspective has to offer here, consider the treatment group T equals 1 in red and the control group T equals 0 in blue here. Each of these groups have associated expected values of outcome. So that's expected value of Y given T equals 1, and that equals Y1 for the treatment group. And similarly, it's Y0 for the control group. Let's label the treatment group, group A, and the control group, group B. Exchangeability means that if we were to swap A and B, so now that B is given treatment and group A is given, given control, the expected values would remain the same. So the expected value of Y given that I assigned treatment equals 1 to group B, is the same as if I had assigned it to group A. And similarly for group A, now that it is receiving control, is going to have the same expected value of Y as if B were receiving control. So what this tells us is that the expected value of the Y1 potential outcome in the treatment group is equal to the expected value of the 
y1 potential outcome in the control group. So the, the one on the left is what we would see before the switch. That was group A before the switch. And then on the right is group B after the switch. This tells you that this is all equal to the expected value of the potential outcome, which means that the potential outcome Y1 is independent from treatment. Similarly, it's the same for the potential outcome Y0. And by independent here, I mean mean independent because there is a expected value, but that distinction isn't too important for our purposes. As an aside here, we have to introduce the concept of identifiability. So here we have the proof that we used, where we used ignorability to show that the average treatment effect is equal to the associational difference. And the important thing is that the average treatment effect um, is a difference between two causal quantities, whereas the associational difference is a difference between two statistical quantities. So identifiability is going from causal quantities to statistical quantities. It's important to get statistical quantities in the end because these are what we actually have access to when we're just looking at samples from the joint distribution P of X, T, Y. We say that a causal quantity, such as expected value of Y, T, is identifiable if we can compute it from a purely statistical quantity such as expected value of y conditioned on t. All right, so ignorability slash exchangeability is a very important assumption because it gives us identifiability of the causal effect. But how reasonable is this assumption? Is there any way that we can make sure this assumption is satisfied? And that's what randomized control trials are for. They can actually make this assumption be satisfied. So a randomized control trial is where you flip a coin to determine what group each individual goes into, if they get treatment equals 1 or treatment equals 0. As an example of this, consider the example we saw before where there was drunk people going to sleep with shoes on and then waking up with headaches. Okay, so the treatment groups looked like this, where treatment is sleeping with shoes on, so most of the people who were sleeping with shoes on were drunk, most of the people who were sleeping without shoes on were sober. What a randomized experimenter would do here is first of all they would change what t means. So t equals 1 would change from meaning went to sleep with shoes on to just slept with shoes on. And similarly t equals 0 would change from went to sleep without shoes on to just slept without shoes on. So you'll see why that's important. So the experimenter would go into a bunch of drunk people's rooms and then flip a coin to decide whether or not to take their shoes off that they had gotten into bed with. And similarly, they would go into a bunch of sober people's rooms and flip a coin to decide whether or not to put shoes on the sober people who are sleeping, you know, as one does. And the effect that this would have is that it would make the groups totally comparable. So by running a randomized controlled trial, the experimenter has eliminated confounding. Randomized controlled trials also have a very nice graphical interpretation. So if this is the graph, the causal graph, of the data generating process, so X is a confounder of the effect of T on Y, a randomized controlled trial would mean that the way that the treatment is assigned is just a function of a coin flip. So there should be no edge from X to T. And by running a randomized control trial, by randomizing treatment, we remove this edge, which removes confounding. This brings us to our next recall question. What important property does an RCT give us? We just saw the exchangeability assumption and how it allows us to identify the causal effect. However, exchangeability assumes a causal graph that looks like this, where basically we're saying that there is no confounding. If there is a covariate x, 
it doesn't confound the effect of treatment on the outcome. But we're often interested in settings where there is confounding. So in this graph on the bottom, X is a common cause of both T and Y, so it confounds the effect of T on Y. In this setting, we have conditional exchangeability, which is that the potential outcome Y1 and Y0 are independent of T conditional on X. Graphically, that means that when we condition on X, we block the confounding. We'll see this more concretely, concretely next week when we study graphical causal models. Just as we used exchangeability to identify the average treatment effect, we can use conditional exchangeability. In this case, we're going to identify what's called the conditional average treatment effect. So here we're looking at the expected difference in potential outcomes conditioned on X. In this first equation, we just use linearity of expectation. Then here we use conditional exchangeability. So because we have independence of the potential outcomes in the treatment conditional on X, we can introduce the treatment into the equation here. And introducing treatment behind the conditioning bar here is just a consequence of conditional independence. Finally, the potential outcome Y1 given treatment equals 1 is the same thing as just the observed outcome given treatment equals 1, and similarly with treatment equals 0. So we've turned this conditional average treatment effect that we started with into a difference between just two statistical quantities. We've identified the conditional average treatment effect. However, you might be interested in just the regular average treatment effect where we're not conditioning on X. This is what we were able to identify with exchangeability. And we can identify that using the adjustment formula. To get the adjustment formula, we simply marginalize out X. So we just took what we had on the previous slide and added the expectation over X on the outside. To get some graphical intuition for this, consider that this is our causal graph, where X is a confounder of the effect of the treatment on the outcome. Then what we're doing is we're conditioning on X here and marginalizing over it to, in order to adjust for X. And that graphically corresponds to blocking the confounding at X there. Again, we'll see this more in detail next week when we cover graphical models, but right now we're just trying to motivate those. Importantly, we've identified the average treatment effect here using the conditional exchangeability assumption, and we've labeled this important result the adjustment formula. Conditional exchangeability, or ignorability, goes by many names. One popular name is unconfoundedness, and we'll use it a lot. We list many of the other names in the associated reading for this section, but for now we'll use unconfoundedness. And an important thing to highlight about this assumption is that in general, unconfoundedness is an untestable assumption. So in this graph, we have that we do have conditional exchangeability. When we condition on X, we get that the potential outcomes and treatment are independent. We have conditional exchangeability given X. but what if there is some other W here that is also a confounder of the effect of T on Y? Then we don't have conditional exchangeability given X. And W here is unobserved. In general, we never know if there are unobserved confounders. So that's why unconfoundedness is an untestable assumption. Unconfoundedness is one very important assumption, and another important one is positivity. So what does positivity say? It says that for all values of covariates, x that are present in the population, so anything with probability greater than zero, we have that the probability of treatment is greater than zero for all values of treatment. In this specific case, I've assumed that the treatment is binary. So another way of saying all values of treatment are greater than zero is just saying that the value of treatment equals 1 is between 0 and 1, exclusive. So why is positivity an important assumption? Well, so recall the adjustment formula. An important thing is that if we did not have positivity, effectively, 
we would be conditioning on zero probability events in the adjustment formula. To make this more clear, consider that x and y are discrete. Then we can rewrite the adjustment formula with summations here as follows. And if x and y were continuous, you would just use an integral here. Now we can rewrite this using Bayes' rule to make things a little bit more clear. Importantly, now we have in the denominator something that looks very relevant for the positivity assumption. Here, p of t equals 1 given x, if that were 0, which would be a positivity violation, then we would have division by 0. So satisfying the positivity assumption gives, it, gives us a guarantee that we won't be dividing by 0, that our adjustment formula will be well defined. Similarly, if t equals 1 given x were equal to 1, then because t is binary here, that would mean that p of t equals 0 given x is equal to 0, and we'd have division by 0 in the second term. This was a mathematical justification for the positivity assumption, but we can also just give some intuition for this. So if this is the total population, and we're interested in some subset of this population where x equals little x, then if you imagine that everyone in that subset were given the control, they were not treated, then how would we know what it would be like if these if this subset were given the treatment. So everyone was not given the treatment, so how can we talk about a causal effect in this subset of the population? Similarly, if everyone were given the treatment, how would we know what it would be like if they didn't receive the treatment? So we wouldn't really be able to talk about the causal effect there. That's the intuition for why the positivity assumption is important. And in the previous slide, which you can go back to, you can see how the adjustment formula will actually be undefined if the positivity assumption is not satisfied. For another perspective on the positivity assumption, consider the concept of overlap. So sometimes you'll see people refer to the same assumption as overlap or common support. These all mean the same thing as positivity. Here, look at the conditional distribution of the covariates, x, given treatment or given control. So these conditional distributions look a lot like the positivity assumption, but the variables are flipped. We used to have conditional of t given x, and now it's conditional of x given t. But, you know, everything's related through Bayes' rule. If we were to visualize these distributions, say they looked like this, they're two uniforms that don't overlap at all. If they don't overlap at all, we have a severe positivity violation. If they were to overlap then there is no positivity violation in among the covariates where there is overlap. But then in the covariates where there is no overlap, we have severe positivity violations, right? So that's because in these two x's, either everyone with that level of covariates received treatment or everyone received control. Similarly, if they completely overlapped if these two conditional distributions, conditional covariate distributions given treatment overlapped completely, then we have no positivity violation. And this is what we want in general in order to have identifiability. And overlap is just another way to look at the positivity assumption. This is just giving you a bit more intuition, a bit more understanding of this assumption. This brings us to the next question which is, what goes wrong if we don't have positivity? You might be able to think of a few different answers of this, but it, it'll help your recall if you can repeat to yourself as many of these answers as you can think of. We just saw unconfoundedness and positivity as two very important assumptions for identifiability. However, they, they are trade-off in some sense. So for unconfoundedness, the general idea, which is not always true, but the general idea is that the more covariates you condition on, the more likely you are to have satisfied unconfoundedness. However, 
the more covariates you condition on, the worse positivity it gets. To see this, consider these two conditional distributions from the last slide. If we just look at their supports, say we consider the case where they're 50% overlapping. This is in one dimension, when the covariates are only one dimensional. But in two dimensions, things get much worse. So if I just were to take that and extend it to two dimensions, you end up with only 25% overlap. This is if we were to condition on covariates, two covariates, right? So a vector of length two. Whereas if the vector was of length one, then we would have 50% overlap, um, which is better than 25% overlap. More overlap is better. And then if we go on to higher and higher dimensions, things go down exponentially. This is due to what's called the curse of dimensionality in machine learning. And this trade-off is very important to keep in mind when you're practicing causal inference. What would actually happen if you were to try to estimate the average treatment effect when you have a severe positivity violation? So we're depicting a severe positivity violation in the bottom here by showing that the covariate distribution, or the, the supports of the covariates in the control group, t equals 0, and the treatment group, t equals 1, do not overlap at all. And here's a reminder of what the adjustment formula looks like when x is discrete. What we'll do is we'll model this conditional expectation of y given treatment equals 1, comma x with a function f1 of x, and we'll do the same with the conditional expectation for the control group with the model f0 of x. Then if I add some data here, so what are these points? The blue points on the left are the control group, and the vertical distance is their value of y, and the red group on the right is the treatment group, and the vertical distance is the value of y. These are color-coded because the control group will be fit with the f0 model, and the treatment group will be fit with the F1 model. But importantly, we have to sum over all x for both of these models, as you can see in the adjustment formula. So we need to know the value of F1 of x over here to the left, and we need to know the value of F0 x over here to the right. But we don't have data there. We don't have data there because we have a severe positivity violation. And, you know, what are our models going to do? They have to extrapolate. They're forced to extrapolate because they need to sum over all x. And this extrapolation is going to cause severe issues. So this is a consequence of having severe positivity violations and using a model to model the conditional expectation when that's the case. With that, we'll wrap up the positivity, overlap, common support assumption. Those are all the different names of it. And move on to the next important assumption, which is no interference. The no interference assumption means that my potential outcome, which could feasibly be a function of the treatments for all of the other units, all of the other individuals in the population, 1 through n, is actually only a function of my own treatment. Okay, so that's this equality that we have here where we end up with just yi ti. Graphically, you could think of this as there being potentially many parents for yi. And I'll give the example of, say the treatment is that I get a dog, and my outcome is my happiness. So I want to see what the causal effect of me getting a dog is on my happiness. You could imagine that my friends getting dogs could affect my happiness as well, because maybe our dogs are more likely to go on a play date, it can increase my social interaction with my friends, say. And what the no interference assumption is saying is that my happiness is not a function of my friends getting dogs. It's only a function of me getting a dog. With that, we can move on to the final important assumption which is called consistency. Consistency is just that if the treatment, capital T, takes on a specific value, little t, 
This implies that the outcome that we observe is the potential outcome yt. This may seem like an assumption that is obviously going to be satisfied. However, it's not the case people write whole papers about why this assumption is so important to ensure it's satisfied. And to give you an example of this, consider that t equals 1 means I get a dog, and t equals 0 means I don't get a dog. So it's the same example as the previous slide. Say that if I were to get a golden retriever, I would observe y equals 1. I would be happy. And this is when I'm taking the treatment. I'm getting a dog. But if I were to get a different dog, a chihuahua, say, I would observe y equals 0. I would be unhappy. And this is the same value of treatment. It's still t equals 1. In some sense, this means that the potential outcome, y1, is not well defined. This is because I'm observing a different potential outcome, y1, depending on, you know, exactly how I get t equals 1. This is an example of a violation of the consistency assumption. Another phrase for violating this aspect of the consistency assumption is known as no multiple versions of treatment. So here we had multiple versions. We had a golden retriever and a chihuahua were different versions of t equals 1. With that, we've finished the four main assumptions for identifiability. And we'll just leave you with these four questions to recall the important aspects of what we just covered. Now that we've gone through these four main assumptions, let's tie them all together in a proof to identify the average treatment effect. Right off the bat, we need to use the no interference assumption to justify that these potential outcomes are only a function of one's own treatment and no other individual's treatment. Then we use linearity of expectation to get this. This isn't an assumption. And we use the law of iterated expectations to get this. Importantly, this will help us apply conditional exchangeability. Now we can use conditional exchangeability or unconfoundedness and positivity. This is the really important step here. So because we've already conditioned on x, we can introduce treatment behind the conditioning bar. And finally, we use consistency. We were using this a lot throughout the lecture without saying it was consistency. Now we're going to make it clear that this is where we actually apply consistency to say that the potential outcome yt given capital T equals little t is equal to the outcome, the observed outcome, given capital T equals little t. Great, so we've shown how to identify the causal effect, but how do we actually estimate specific numbers? You know, how do we get 5 or 10, whatever the true average treatment effect is? How do we get that specific number? And that's what we'll do now uh, in a complete example. Before we get into the details of this example, we first have to define some terms that are commonly used in statistics. The first is estimand, which is any quantity we want to estimate. We'll subcategorize estimand into a causal estimand and a statistical estimand. A causal estimand is one where, for example, it contains potential outcomes. So the average treatment effect is an example of a causal estimate. In contrast, a statistical estimate does not contain causal concepts. It doesn't contain potential outcomes, for example. So it just contains things like conditional expectations, and the adjustment formula gives us a quantity that is a statistical estimate. So it goes from the ATE, a causal estimate, to this quantity right here, which is a statistical estimate because it doesn't have any potential outcomes in it. And we can actually estimate statistical quantities from data, unlike causal quantities. An estimate is some approximation of an estimate using data. Estimation is the process of getting an estimate from data and some estimate. Okay, so we have some target estimate that we want to estimate, and we use data to estimate it, which gives us an estimate. 
A useful picture to keep in mind is the identification estimation flowchart. So this flowchart, reading from left to right, we start with a causal estimate, and then we get a statistical estimate using the process of identification. That's what we saw when we proved that we can transform the ATE from a causal estimate into a statistical estimate using those four important assumptions. Then with estimation, we go from a specific statistical estimate to an estimate. And the estimate is going to be a number like two or five. And this is what we will see shortly, is an example of estimation. The problem we'll use for this example is estimating the effect of sodium intake on blood pressure. This is an important problem because 46% of Americans have high blood pressure, and high blood pressure is associated with increased risk of mortality. We'll take this example from epidemiology, specifically from Luque Fernandez et al., 2018. And the outcome in this example is systolic blood pressure, which is a continuous quantity. The treatment is sodium intake, which is also a continuous quantity, and it'll be measured in milligrams. We will binarize this quantity by making it 1 if it's above 3.5 milligrams, and zero if it's below 3.5 milligrams. This binarization isn't important for this example, as we'll see. Even if we keep it as continuous, we'll still get the same answer, but we do it because the adjustment formula that we'll be using that we showed you is for binary treatments, and just to keep things simple, we'll use that for now. The covariates in this example are two. The first is age, and the second is the amount of protein excreted in urine, which happens to be relevant for this problem. And this example from this paper is a simulation, so we know the true ATE is 1.05 because we have access to the code for the simulation. In fact, we have code in the book, so if you go to the associated reading for this part of the course, you'll see a link to a GitHub repo that gives you code for all of this. Now that we've specified all the details of this problem, let's actually get to estimation of the ATE. The true ATE is 1.05. First, we have to identify the average treatment effect by using the adjustment formula to turn it into a statistical estimate. So the average treatment effect is a causal estimate, we turn it into a statistical estimate. Now we actually need to go through the process of estimation, the novel part of this part of the lecture. The first thing we do is we take the outer expectation in the adjustment formula, the right-hand side of the above equation, and we replace it with an empirical mean over x. So we replace an expectation over x with an empirical mean over x. Then we model these conditional expectations. In this example, we'll use linear regression, which turns out to work well because the simulated data is actually linear. We can actually use any model that is minimizing the mean squared error, where it's the mean squared error of the prediction of y given treatment and x as inputs. When we take an empirical mean over x, so over our data, and we fit a model to our data, we can get an actual estimate. And that specific estimate we get, in this case, is 0.85. In contrast, the naive estimate that we would get if we were to just fit a model for y given t, so just regressing y on t, and then subtracting those two modeled conditional expectations, if we were to do that naive approach, we would get an estimate of 5.33. So recall that the true ATE is 1.05. This naive estimate is 407% off the true ATE. In contrast, our estimate is only 19% off when we adjust for x here. We used the adjustment formula on the previous slide to get an estimate of the ATE, but it turns out in this specific setting, because our data are generated via a linear function, we actually can just use the coefficient in front of t 
in the linear regression. So in order to do this, we first assume a linear parametric form. So that's that our outcome is generated as a linear function of t and x. Then, given this assumption, we just run linear regression. We regress y on t and x to estimate alpha and beta here. Estimates have hats on top of them. And if we were to do this, we would actually get alpha hat equals 0 0.85, the exact same estimate that we got in the previous slide when we used the adjustment formula. And we have code for this on the code GitHub that's linked in the corresponding part of the book. This is quite useful because if we have continuous treatments, we might not be interested in this specific difference in potential outcomes for when t equals 1 and t equals 0. More generally, we could be interested in just the expected value of yt. So this is a function of t. And if we were to run linear regression, we're keeping t continuous, so this data actually is originally continuous and then we binarized t, we would still get this same value of alpha. And you can run this for yourself and see that when you keep t continuous, you get the exact same estimate. So this approach is extremely simple. All we have to do is fit a linear regression and then take the coefficient in front of t as our estimate. So that's great. And additionally, it has the benefit of collapsing this whole function of t, expected value of yt, down into a single scalar. And this is great. It's great power, but we're only able to do this because of some important assumptions we made, which have pretty severe implications. So the first is, well, the main one is that we assumed a linear parametric form. This actually has the implication that the causal effect is the same for all individuals in the population, which can be a pretty unnatural assumption in most cases. So this is implied by the assumption of a linear parametric form, and to show you this, just consider that yit is equal to alpha t plus beta xi. That's just taking that assumed parametric form and then writing out the unit level potential outcome that that implies. Then if we take the unit level causal effect, we can write it as follows, where the minus alpha times zero term is just zero, and then the beta terms cancel, and we just get alpha. So this, importantly, does not depend on xi, which means that the unit level causal effect is the same, no matter what xi is. It's the same for all individuals. It's always alpha. And this is implied by this linear parametric form that we assumed. So in general, it's not a good idea to use just the coefficient of linear regression and some authors have more extended critiques of this. Morgan and Winship is the book that we link to in our course reading, and I encourage you to check this out. But I figured I'd just show this to you because it's commonly used. And in our case, where we actually have linear data, it does give us the right answer in this simple case. And here's a link to Morgan and Winship. It's just section 6.2 and 6.3 where they give this more complete critique of using the coefficient in linear regression as the estimate of your average treatment effect. With that complete example of estimating the average treatment effect done, we will conclude the potential outcomes lecture. If you want to get notifications for when next week's lecture comes out, then go ahead and subscribe and click the bell below. Also, go ahead and leave any questions you have about the lecture in the comments below, and I'll make sure to get to them as soon as I can. Thank you for watching.